how do we know we know something? How do we know? How do we know that we know something? My name is James and welcome to my YouTube channel. If you haven't been here before, this is where I talk about everything to do with research. When do you think you understand something sufficiently well that you can say you truly know it? Now, one of the people who felt that they knew something was the Nobel Prize winner and physicist Richard Feynman. So Feynman is very famously quoted as saying, I have the advantage of having found out how hard it is to get to really know something, how careful you have to be about checking your experiments, how easy it is to make mistakes and fool yourself. I know what it means to know something. What Feynman was mostly talking about was that distinction between people who spend and dedicate their lives to examining something and trying to understand what it means versus those people that maybe pick up a book at an airport and then after two days say, well, I fully understand that. That's not really what this video is about. In this video, I'm going to talk about maybe two conflicting, though we'll see if they're conflicting, ways in which we can think about whether we know something or not. Now, the first person I'm going to talk about is Karl Popper. This is Popper's book, The Logic of Scientific Discovery, and it's a, it's a very interesting book, hugely influential, and for the most part, he's known as the person who gave us falsifiability. Now, the interesting thing about Popper was that he was a huge, huge fan of rigorous scientific study, but the way in which he felt you got to know something was a bit different than what had preceded it. What Popper said was, you must construct a study in such a way that it's possible to falsify or prove wrong what it is that you're testing. And so the era of hypothesis testing it didn't quite start with him, but it's been very, very important ever since. And I guess that these days, if you write a grant proposal to a scientific body and it doesn't have hypothesis testing in there, then you're open to opening yourself to the possibility that the reviewers will say, this is just a fishing expedition. Nonetheless, let's just have a think about hypothesis testing. So the central part of that is that you have two hypotheses, a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis. The null hypothesis is something like no matter if we apply the treatment to this sample, it makes no difference. So for instance, if you've got a sample of bacteria that are growing in a little tube, your hypothesis might be that adding some antibiotic to those bacteria will make no difference. That's your null hypothesis. There's no difference when you treat the sample. And of course, then you can easily test that by having two samples, one that you do not treat, and you can measure the growth of the bacteria in that sample, and one that you do treat with the supposed antibiotic, and see what happened there. And you can measure if there's a difference in the growth rate between the two, and you can test it in that way. So Popper said that what distinguished science from non-science was this idea of falsifiability. But what happens if you can't easily carry out the scientific experiment where you're testing the null and the alternative hypotheses? What do you do then? You can imagine experiments that might require entire planets and very, very long periods of time in order to test particular hypotheses. And it's just not going to be possible to do that. One of the classic examples is, of course, evolution, evolutionary biology. And it goes without saying today that we agree, at least most people agree, that evolution started sometime about four and a half billion years ago when two molecules interacted with each other in some way, and there's been life ever since. It got more complex, things got membranes, and things got compartmentalized into cells, and DNA, and metabolism, and, you know, things like us came along. However, say a hundred years ago, it was simply not going to be possible to test the hypothesis of evolution. You could not rerun the tape of evolution for four and a half billion years. And many of the data sets that you would need to test this hypothesis, many of those data sets simply didn't exist. It was going to be almost impossible to satisfy Popper's ideas in order to verify that evolutionary biology is in fact a science. So 
the way in which we even now think about evolutionary biology somewhat steps outside Popper's ideas. So we must go to an earlier philosopher, William Hewell, who was a 19th century philosopher from the north of England. He eventually became master of the University of Cambridge, polymathic, worked in lots and lots of areas. But one of the things that he's known for is the idea of consilience. So starting out, he said that we could make inductions. So a class of data could potentially give you some part of an answer, and you could make an induction about that class of data. You could decide that it means a particular thing. And then another class of data, and then another class of data. And if you're working on a particular area, and all of those inductions from all those different kinds of data, if they all agreed on the same thing, if they were consilient, and consilience literally means jumping together, if they all jumped together, then you could have a very strong body of theory that was derived from these inductions. Karl Popper rejected this as a means of finding out that you know something. He said that the easiest thing we could do is fool ourselves and that we needed a more rigorous way of doing things. But when confronted with evolutionary biology, Popper was a little less sure. Today, we know that evolutionary biology is a strong theory because in part, we can test some elements of evolutionary biology theory using Popper's framework. We can make phylogenetic trees and test them mathematically to see which tree shape, which tree topology best fits the data that we collect from genetics or from morphology, the shapes of animals and plants and, uh, and so on. We can look at plate tectonics. And we can look at the movement of land masses. And we can say, for instance, that the marsupials of Australia and marsupials of South America, that they share a more recent common ancestor exclusive of all the other mammals. We can look at genetics. We can look at genomics. We can look at behavior. We can look at chemistry. We can look at the fossil record. We can look at radioisotope decay. All of these agree on a single narrative that evolution has taken place for the last four and a half billion years, and it continues to take place every single day. And so there's a mixture of Popper's ideas and hypothesis testing along with Hewell's consilience. And so I think there's a resolution here of this, and to a certain extent, while Popper's philosophy advocates for a very rigorous and very robust way of thinking about research, there's a little bit of room for Hewell and the idea that you might have consilience across different data types. I'd be very interested in knowing what you think about all, all of this. Please leave a comment down below and it would really help if you would like and subscribe to the channel. Thank you.